Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Nicole Vignola Show. It's me, Nick, your pocket neuroscientist. If you are new here, I essentially help explain the brain so that life can feel a little bit less scary. Please could you hit the subscribe button and help me grow this channel so we can take to the stratosphere and beyond. So without further ado, today we're going to talk about how to stop letting people disrespect you. A type of people pleasing. I've been there. I think we can all resonate with that feeling. If you've ever walked away from a conversation feeling small, dismissed, like you had to silence yourself, then this video is for you. The problem is that disrespect doesn't always present itself in the most clear way. You know, if someone calls you a name, you can very easily identify that, but sometimes the disrespect is quite subtle. And in that moment, for me personally as well, I can definitely resonate with this, it sometimes takes us a couple of seconds to realize that actually that person just said that. Or even worse, you walk away and you're like, oh, actually I just realized now what actually happened. And the thing is, sometimes it's also wrapped up in a smile, but central nervous system always knows. And so today we're gonna to be talking about three ways in which people may be disrespecting you without you realizing it and how you can take back the control. So before we get into it, I just wanna talk a little bit about the science of what's going on here. So what's happening is your amygdala is part of the limbic system that is responsible for detecting threats in your environment, even social threats. And what that does is that when it detects a threat, it triggers a central nervous system to put you in a state of fight, flight, freeze, or fawn, which we're gonna get into in a second. Now, here's the thing, you might override that feeling to try and preserve the connection. You might try and rationalize it to try and preserve the connection, or you may just simply not realize that this is happening to you until hindsight which is a wonderful thing. But chronic overriding of this feeling can lead to fawning, which may be a way for you to mitigate what's going on. So what fawning looks like is you may be overly friendly or you may brush off the joke as something funny or you may start to overcompensate in the behavior to try and appease the person in front of you. It's essentially a type of people pleasing. And this is where boundaries come in. Now the word boundaries, I know I appreciate, is kind of like, okay, what are they? I know that they're being overused a lot, but when we start to acknowledge that some of these things that are being said to us around us are off, we can start to retrain our central nervous system to pay attention to these cues a little bit sooner so that the next time someone disrespects you, you can actually recognize it in that moment. Because I personally know that I only really recognize them in hindsight sometimes when I've walked away from the conversation. But by instilling these boundaries, you're retraining your central nervous system to be more finely attuned to what is going on in your environment. So number one, people may dismiss you and your feelings and pass them off as jokes or sarcasm. A very common one is relax, it was just a joke, or you're being a bit sensitive right now, or are you on your period if you're a woman? That one's quite common. One way that we can rewire that is to say that didn't feel like a joke to me. Because sometimes people will dismiss your feelings by adding in that joke and that sarcasm because they don't want to acknowledge that you've just said something that actually carries some weight and some vulnerability. And so the question is, are you allowing this to happen because you haven't been finally attuned to this or because you don't know how to be vulnerable and stand tall and stand grounded in the thing that you've just said. The problem is that every time we accept this type of behavior, you start to distrust your emotional clarity. So when your brain is telling you something, you start to feel confused in that noise that information, you're not really sure if you're overreacting or if you should react at all, if you actually heard that properly. And I think that it's really important to pay attention to these things so that we can really turn the dial on our emotional center so that we can essentially also instill a level of self-trust. Number two is they will act confused when you enforce your boundaries or they just overstep them altogether. So these subtle ones are Things like friends that cancel plans last minute or they want to change the time all the time. You know, there are those friends that do that. I don't know if you can resonate with that, but personally, your time is not more important than mine. And I take that same attitude when I think about my friends. My time is not more important than somebody else's. Now, if it's a one-off thing that happens, of course things happen, you want to change, absolutely fine that friend that always rocks up late, that friend that always cancels last minute, and that friend that always wants to change the plans. 
that is a type of disrespect. Are you allowing it? And then are they enacting this behavior because they know that you'll budge every time? Because maybe they do think that your time is not as important as theirs. Maybe they have a fancier job than you. But your time is just as important, no matter the job, no matter the requirements, no matter the responsibilities. Yes, people have different responsibilities. They have, maybe they're caregivers, maybe they are parents. But again, every now and again is okay, of course. We're friends, we all understand. But it's just a calling to pay attention to whether it's a type of disrespect. The, the, the underlying theme here is that the intent is different. If your friend genuinely has an issue and can't do the time, then of course. But the intent behind it, is it coming from a place of disrespect? I don't care about your time. Your time is less valuable than mine. Therefore, I'm going to cancel these plans yet again. Pay attention to that. You do not need to entertain these kind of friendships. And you can voice yourself. You are very well in your right to say, hey, you're actually disrespecting my time. And I know that you probably think that mine isn't as important as yours, but let me tell you, I still have things that I want to do. Number three, this one is really common that I hear in a lot of clients of mine. They want to dump on you all the time without reciprocity. So they always want you to give them an opinion, to help them with something, to tell you about their story, to tell you about their life, but never actually really want to listen to what you have to say about your life. And probably even more disrespectful is when you give them the advice that they were asking for and then they don't actually do it. How many times have you given that friend the advice they were looking for and then they went off and did their own thing anyway? It might be funny, but that is a type of disrespect. It is somebody who's coming into your life when it suits them to gain something from you without actually respecting what you have to say because if they did, they would take it on board and they would apply it to their lives. And they would show up for you when you need that same level of support. Are they ghosting you? Because now it's your turn to actually need some support, some advice, some help, some venting. You know, we do need to vent as humans, it's part of life. The minor inconveniences of being a human. <laughs> What's happening here is you're stuck in a one-sided co-regulation loop. What that means is you're regulating them and they're relying on you for regulation. But when it comes to you needing to get their help in regulating yourself, they're not there to support you. That is a type of disrespect. And what you're doing there is a type of people pleasing. What happens here is your nervous system gets wired to care for them but it learns that there's no safety in being friends with them. And so I want you to pause and ask yourself, who is actually holding space for you? Who's holding space for you without wanting anything in return? Those that are not doing that for you probably need to be either eliminated or a boundary needs to be set. If someone needs you to shrink so that they can feel big, they are not your person. The moment you stop explaining your boundaries and you just start enforcing them because people will respond to actions. Now, the problem is, is if you enforce a boundary and then you let people overstep that boundary, they will learn that it doesn't matter if you try and enforce it. They can just do what they want anyway. So you have to stick to that boundary, whatever it may be, whether it's calling it out, whether it's not calling them anymore, whether it's not hanging out with them, whether it's actually saying, you do not bring peace to my life, you do not add value to my life, I do not want to engage in this until you've decided that you actually want to, I don't know, give me X, Y, Z. The minute you start to enforce your boundaries through action, you start to teach a central nervous system that you have your own back, that you can trust yourself, that you are safe, in your own ability to make decisions for yourself. And that is a truly powerful thing. If you found this helpful, then please like, comment, subscribe. It's me, Nick, your pocket neuroscientist.